Good morning, everyone who's joining. You can see the participants coming in the virtual door. Good morning, good morning. Oh, yeah. So fun. Yay. It's like magic. It's like the door just opened and everyone walks in. <laughs> flood. The flood of friends. Right. Without stumbling over one another. <laughs> right. And without getting stuck in the waiting room, which I feel like is the new Zoom, <laughs> the new Zoom problem. We're going to give everybody a second to get in before we get started, but welcome to everyone. So nice to see so many familiar faces. Well, I guess not faces, just Heather and Brian's faces, but familiar names. Nice to see lots of friends. For sure. All within one minute, everyone flooded in. That's so cool. It's true. They were all just waiting for the doors to open. Um, I'll say good morning. Everyone's chatting. Good morning. Um, I think, Heather, that because people were already registered and they're going to send out the recordings, that we can go ahead and get started. Um, if you want to start welcoming folks, I'll drop in the handouts into the chat. Oh, thank you, Amy. Yeah. Great. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you for coming, everybody. We're really so glad to be with you again. It feels like, at least for me, it feels like it's been a really long time. And I've been missing you all and thinking about you all, feeling really grateful for all of your service um, through this crazy year. And so happy to be um, back together again. Uh, my, my name, by the way, is Heather Berg. I'm the coordinator for the Central Valley School-Based Health Coalition. And uh, we have a really amazing presentation uh, for you today. Um, the presenter is Brian Sempson, who's the Director of Recreational Resilience Programs at Every Neighborhood Partnership, which you also probably know as ENP, and also um, a, a key leader in the Trauma and Resiliency Network. Uh, for FCHIP and just doing all sorts of other things, certified trainings and consulting and all kinds of other things. And I'll let him get into all of that a bit more um, as we go forward. And so we're just really glad to have you all again. And um, so again, this is, uh, I'm Heather Berg and we have um, some support and some um, and some friends here from CSHA, the California School-Based Health Alliance. We have Amy Ranger and we have Asma Ahmed and um, they are here with us as well. And we're going to um, have a presentation from Brian Simpson on pandemic fa fatigue and resilience featuring tools from the community resilience model. And then we'll have some announcements and we'll close up. So um, we're glad again that you can all be here. And um, Amy, do you want to talk a little bit about CSHA? Sure, just a quick welcome from the California School Based Health Alliance. Um, I think most of you are familiar with us. I recognize a lot of names. We are the statewide nonprofit that helps support school health programming and school based health centers across California. And we have invested in the last 10 years really deeply in the Central Valley specifically because we love the work that you all are doing and believe in your um, focus on young people and getting them health services into their school. So we've done um, worked with you all in a lot of different ways, one of which is this quarterly gathering of school health providers and administrators to learn from one another. And we're really excited to have Brian present to us today. Um, we also have a, an upcoming annual convening that Heather will talk about in the end, but just in case you drop off before the end, go ahead and save March 11th, because um, for those of you who are with us the last three years, it's a really amazing gathering of hundreds of folks from the Valley together to learn about mental health best practices specifically um, with our partners from well, REL West at West Ed. Um, and uh, I know Heather did some housekeeping, but we will have time to hear from you all at the end. We have at least 15 minutes at the end. And um, at that point, we can enable voices that everyone can actually speak to one another. Um, until then, we do have the chat and the Q&A open and Heather and I will be moderating those. So by all means, jump in with questions and or thoughts. Um, and our website is here, but definitely reach out to us with other ideas and questions and needs. Um, 
in the future and, and welcome and nice to see your names and excited to hear your voices. Yeah, thank you, Amy. And yes, um, we, we will be um, help supporting Brian with the Q&A and with the chat. So if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. If we don't have your uh, voice enabled yet, you can speak through the, the chat and the Q&A and we'll make sure Brian uh, sees them and he can um, talk with you. So we'll go ahead and um, go to the next slide, I think. Yep. Okay, Brian, here, here you go. All right, so I'm going to attempt to take over the PowerPoint. Good morning. Um, and so this was working earlier this morning. So let's see how we're gonna do this here. All right. There we go, hang on. Okay. And there we go. So I want to just start off with um, kind of uh, the work that I get to do, the privilege that I have in doing this work. Uh, I'm on staff with Every Neighborhood Partnership and I oversee the recreational resilience programming and essentially I get paid to play. Um, what we found is that play is the uh, workhorse of human development uh, across the lifespan. And then especially as we start working with under-resourced communities impacted by trauma and adversity, we found that this was a, um, an amazing way to build resilience within individuals in the community. And so that's my role with EMP. Um, I'm also fortunate to co-facilitate a cross-sector uh, network, uh, the Fresno County Trauma and Resiliency Network, uh, where we are uh, advancing the cause of um, informing uh, cross-sector partners on um, how to utilize the trauma sciences to build resilience within the populations that they serve. And so there's some amazing work going on in Fresno. Uh, I've also been able to co-found a nonprofit called BrainWise Solutions. And what those, all those organizations have is a shared purpose. Um, and that purpose is to inspire, nurture, and connect with people who are passionate about the purpose of building um, thriving and resilient communities. And so that's my personal mission statement, uh, purpose statement. And those values that those organizations allow me to practice is this idea of service, justice, dignity, respect, and worth. And so uh, I tell folks that this is the, the work that I get to do. Um, there's a lot of things that uh, we have to do in life, but uh, this happens to be one of the things that I get to do. And um, Heather, we may have to go back to uh, letting you advance those slides for me. Um, uh, my iPad is having a little bit of a challenge. So if you could uh, take us back, um, I'd appreciate that. There we go. Sorry, Brian, I think we can both. So um... okay. So you want me to go back a little bit? Yeah, let's go back just after that shared purpose slide, my um, and land on our resilience question. Oh, gotcha. Okay, is that good? Okay, there okay. you go. That's perfect. That's okay. perfect. And I think I might be able to maneuver it now. It's bigger on my screen. All right. So here's what I'd like you all to do. Um, we're going to start this off with uh, a resilience question. So I want you to drop in the chat. And I want you to uh, maybe even jot it down on a piece of paper. We're going to come back to this, the answers to these questions later. What or who uplifts you? I want you to think about the person or the thing that, that when you're down, it uplifts you. Or I want you to write down the answer to the second question, which is what or who gives you strength? When you're just feeling depleted, weak, is there a person or is there something that just invigorates you? And then the third question would be, what or who helps you get through hard times? So I'll give you a couple minutes, drop those into chat. Um, I see some of the answers coming in. Okay. Jesus strengthens me, travel, family, friends, music. Good. So those three questions as you're as you guys are are sharing this. Oh, I got a gardening friend. See that? Nature and kids. Okay. And they're starting to come in a little quicker. Family, dog, faith, walking. 
the dog for me is like sometimes sometimes it's not too encouraging <laughs> okay so as those are coming in as you're thinking about those i want you to hold those in your thoughts and remember these three questions these three the answers to these three questions okay and um because we're going to use them in a there you go go ahead heather in a resiliency pause resiliency pauses can bring help bring you back into a balanced state of mind and body during difficult times it is also important to remember what else is true so for a moment right i just want to invite you to just call to mind those answers that you um, dropped into the chat. And, and I just want you to just really kind of um, center in the joy, the, the encouragement, the strength of those answers. And I want you to notice the sensation. I want you to notice the pleasant sensations that might come to mind and just kind of allow that to fill you for a moment. You might even want to take a nice deep breath and just welcome all of that positive reflection as you think about what brings you strength, what uplifts you, and what helps you get through tough times. All right. Heather, if we can go ahead and advance the slide. And so um, just kind of give you some some objectives for our our, our lesson our, our breakout today i want to define pandemic um, pandemic fatigue and resilience and we want to describe um a resilient focused approach it's it's a little bit it's building off a trauma-informed approach um but but I, I really want to emphasize the resilience focus and then we're going to talk i'm going to describe a little bit the community resiliency model which is an evidence-based uh program to help build individual and community resilience. And then we're gonna go through and I wanna demonstrate um, just three of the skills and also provide uh, a resource that's a help now resource. And then um, we're gonna look at three of the six biologically based life skills that's, um, that make up the uh, community resiliency model. And then just a little design for self, a self care strategy. And so with that, next slide. So I want you guys to drop and think about pandemic fatigue. It's the weariness we feel in dealing with this situation that we're in right now, right? COVID-19 has had such a, a huge impact in the daily routines and the flows of life, right? But it, it, it's not only COVID, right? There are so many other things and there's just this huge sense of, of being overwhelmed, right? And it's been a long, uh, it's been a long year. It was almost like 2020 started and then it's just like, it's been, it went by so quick, but it felt so long. And that's this idea of pandemic um, fatigue is a combination of mental, physical and mental exhaustion. Next slide. I kind of look at it like uh, having a flat tire, an emotional flat tire. Right. <laughs> you just, have, have you ever just tried to you know, get in the car and you're ready to go and then all of a sudden you realize you have a flat tire. Right. And so this idea of fatigue, there, there's this element of, of, of fear. Right. And, and it's not this ever present right in your face uh, looking at a bear kind of fear. It's this low simmer. That's characterized by frustration, irritation. Even and in, in, in it may show up with short, snappy responses. Um, there's a sense of loneliness, withdrawal, with all the safety protocols and and physical distancing. Um, I'm gonna tell you, I love uh, trainings and social engagement, and Zoom is just uh, it's a tough space to be in. It's a tough um, modality to, to share right I, and I try to do the best I can to encourage engagement but not seeing your faces right now uh it, my nervous system is a little activated because I'm, I'm not getting that, that energy exchange I'm not seeing the facial responses 
Um, and so that can, that can create a lot of anxiety as well, right? Worry, nervousness. These are all those things that are over a long period of time just feel like flat tire. And then we get tired, <laughs> right? Um, I remember I first started doing Zoom uh, earlier this year and I'm like, man, I've, I've done this hour and a half meeting and it feels like four, right? Just this kind of weariness, right? So that's this idea of, of pandemic fatigue and, and it kind of models what we see in um, helping professionals with uh, burnout, right? And compassion fatigue. And so this is a real deal. And the work that uh, um, all of us are doing as helping professionals within the education sector, the health sector, any of those that we're giving of ourselves to others, um, we're susceptible to this, this fatigue. And so my hope is today that we'll be able to look at some, um, some skills and some things we could do to help mitigate some of that uh, um, flat tires. As a matter of fact, next slide kind of gives me an, gives an illustration of what I'm hoping this might be, right? Um, it, in resilience, right, I want to define resilience is an individual's and community's ability. And I want to stress this idea, right? It's an ability to identify and use both individual and collective um, strengths in, a, in, in a living fully with compassion in the present moment and um, not just surviving, but thriving, right? And in, in, in daily living. So um, when we look at resilience, that's my hope that we're gonna be able to do that. The next slide, I think kind of illustrates what I'm hoping this looks like, right? It's a fix a flat. <laughs> we're hoping that uh, some of the things that we talk about today, we're gonna to be looking at biologically based, resilience focused life skills. And we can build and develop these um, at any age. And what, you know, what's really exciting is you can teach these to kids. I teach these to my five-year-old, right? Um, she practices these. I have to remind her, I have to prompt her. Um, but, but these are absolutely um, usable across the lifespan. And so we're going to be looking at the life skills of tracking, resourcing, grounding, and then help now. Okay. And so moving on into uh, this next section here, resilience focus, we're going to be describing the resilience focused approach. Next slide. So most of us that are, have been doing this work and have been exposed to trauma informed practices, we've recognized the shift, right? There is a perspective shift. We, we um, as a result of learning around about the ACEs study and um, the, the impact on neural development, we begin, to, we begin to ask better questions, right? We had a different perspective. We, we saw things a little bit differently, right? We started asking what happened rather than what's wrong with you, right? But here's the thing. It didn't change what we were what we were looking at. It changed how we saw what we were looking at, but it didn't change what we were looking at. And so I want to propose, next slide, that there's a there's there's more of a shift that can happen. And that shift involves a shift towards resilience focused, right? And um I can't see all the of the slide on my Heather, all the, the text up in that box. There we go. Let me, yeah, so go ahead and click through so all that the text will come up in the green box. There we go. I forgot to take these advances out. So here's what a resilience focus does. It helps us to see people differently. Not just keep looking at their behaviors and looking at what's wrong with them and just asking a new question, like what happened that that's wrong with you right? It's a total paradigm shift. And we're looking and we're seeing, and we're asking the question, what else is true? We're asking better questions, right? What else is true? Yes, these things happen. Yes, they've had um, an impact and we see this behavior, but we also recognize that you're resilient in the midst of dealing with these adversities. Have you ever thought about this? You can't be resilient without adversity. I'm going to let that sit there for a minute. <laughs> I wish I could see everybody's face right now, right? But the very essence of being resilient is, is the fact that you had an adversity and you were able to adapt and still have healthy outcomes in spite of the adversity. Without the level of adversity, uh, some level of adversity, um, we don't get the opportunity to build our resilience. And the key is whether or not 
the adversity is overwhelming our capacities. If the adversity doesn't overwhelm our capacities, then we have the opportunity to build resilience. And so the goal in this is how do we expand our capacity? Resilience is like a muscle, it could be exercised, right? And so when we shift from looking at the trauma and we begin to look at the inherent resilience that our communities have, that people have who are going through that trauma, we can reshift what we're looking at and we could ask questions about, um, wow, in spite of that, you're still alive. That's amazing, right? We can start drawing attention to the strengths. We can redefine the behavior as an attempt to meet a need, albeit maybe perhaps um, having some secondary consequences, <laughs> right? But we can see behavior differently. This is an empowered person who's doing what they need to do in order to survive in a very tough place. And it shifts how we think about it. We, we changed our needs now. We see that maybe what they need is skill-based. Maybe, maybe we need to teach to the gaps. Maybe they need some scaffolding to come alongside, right? Whether it's relationally, skills, we, we start to see things differently when we have a resilience focus. So if you get nothing else out of this presentation today, that's the takeaway. Trauma informs good, but I gotta tell you, we start on the wrong side of the, of the sideline when we start with trauma. <laughs> and so we wanna be resilient, focused, trauma informed, right? So that's, that's my soapbox. Next slide, please. So the Community Resiliency Model is an evidence-based uh, program that has uh, been used around the world in under-resourced countries and communities um, that have been impacted by war, um, genocide. Um, in the States, they've done some work and some uh, research utilizing a short-term intervention using these skills during Katrina with uh, social work professionals who went into the area to help and were experiencing high rates of secondary trauma and, and compassion fatigue from being exposed to just all the things that were going on during Katrina. And they did a three hour intervention session with this and they found um, at uh, three, six, uh, and I think nine mo months post training, they were still reporting, those social workers were still reporting some benefit from, from that three hour intervention training that they were still utilizing the skills and receiving some benefit from this. So um, this is a great uh, 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 curriculum. I really like it because it's biologically based. In other words, if your body goes, you got the tools. Wherever your body goes, right, these skills go with you. They're biologically based and resilient focused. Um, it works across the lifespan, right? Like I said, I teach these to my five-year-old. I'm 53 this year and, and I'm, I'm still learning. So um, wherever you're at in that spectrum between cradle and casket, you can use them. Uh, the other thing is that they're so, um, they're designed in such a way that at different literacy label, levels, right? Third world countries, uh, CRIM, CRIM teachers were going, that's what they refer to, CRM, CRIM. They're going into these communities and teaching these skills across different um, um, literacy uh, abilities and getting phenomenal responses and, and building these skills. Next slide, please. So part of, of the framework is creating a common language around these skills. Next slide. So what we wanna talk about, and, and Heather, go ahead and click one more time through there. We wanna talk about the resilient zone. That resilient zone is, is that, that place where you're dealing, this is where life happens, good, bad, and the ugly, right? One more slide, that's good, go ahead. So the good, bad, and the ugly happen, right? We can be happy, we can be sad, we can be frustrated, we, and we still kind of go through this ebb and flow. We're still doing all right. This is the zone of resilience. This is that place where we're still experiencing well-being. It's when we get bumped, next slide. When we are out operating outside of our capacity. Go ahead, there you go. All right, a couple of clicks, Heather. There you go, one more. So what happens is that dotted line represents our current capacity. It represents our resilient zone. Some of us have been through a lot of experiences and a lot of difficulty. We have a narrow zone of well-being, right? Anything can bump us up high 
or, or bump us down low, right? That high activation is where we have, it's characterized with a lot of energy, anxiety, mania, kind of just uh, someone who's flipped their lid and lost their stuff, right? And then the other way is sometimes we feel so overwhelmed, we just become that, that freeze, going to that freeze cycle, right? You know, what I like to call Eeyore, the Eeyore side, like, oh, well, what does it matter? You know, tail fell off, oh, well, nothing's gonna change anyway. And you just kind of give up, right? And so what happens is that those overwhelming experiences either bumps us up or bumps us down. The goal with these skills is how do we increase our well-being zone? How do we exercise everyday life and increase the zone of well-being? Next slide. And that's what these skills will help us do. So we see here, the, the notice that our, our, our nervous system, that's what we're wanting to do. The first thing we want to start to do in these skills that we're going to look at is noticing our nervous system, noticing the, the various biological processes that take place when I'm going up, right? When I'm going to that high zone. Might be heart rate, butterfly feeling in my stomach, might be clenching my teeth, right? Starting to recognize those somatic, those body responses that are indicators I'm going high and I'm being bumped outside of my resilience zone. Or maybe I feel fatigued, I feel drawn down, I don't know what to do, I'm bored. I'm depressed, I don't wanna get out of bed. I don't even wanna eat, right? So those might be those, those indicators, right? That, that show that I'm in a depressive mood. And what we're seeing is this bi-directional response in our nervous system, right? That as um, our, our, our stress level increases, that automated, that uh, sympathetic system, our digestive system um, begins to decrease. And then inverse, as we're looking at the parasympathetic system, which is that rest and digest, like, that's the break, right? So what we see is the gas and break in our nervous system here. Okay, next slide. All right. So drop in the, in the chat, if you can, real quick here. Um, go back one slide, Heather. I wanna see, just kind of check in because I've been talking a lot. <laughs> um, go back one more slide. I want people to, what are some common um, reactions when you are bumped up, right? What are some physical reactions? What are some mental uh, thoughts that happen? What are some emotions, right? What are some of those typical reactions when you're bumped up high or when you're bumped down low? And drop those in the chat. If we were in person, we'd turn and talk to your neighbor. We'd talk around the table. And this is where everybody was like, oh, okay, now we get to talk. And then I get to take a breath high sweating. I want you to think of the action. I want you to think of some, some, um, some verbs, right? What are some things that you do? There you go. Snappy, right? Crab. <laughs> yes. Crabby. Tense. Oh yes. Right in my neck in the middle of my back is where I'm tense. Good. Yes. Less compassion. I justify like, well, if you just listen, that wouldn't have happened, huh? <laughs> Good. Neck and headaches, loss of sleep. Avoidant. Man, he won't answer my email. What's going on? <laughs> have you ever read an email and there's there is an expectation at the end of the email for you to reply, but you're you're either bumped up or you're bumped down and you're not sending that email back yet. Right. <laughs> and the other person on the other line, man, I told me I need to know. I gotta make right. <laughs> that, that's just me, maybe not you guys. Yes, on the email. <laughs> oh, this is good, good. All right, Heather, next slide. And, and the part that I wanted to point out, guess what? It's common, <laughs> we're not alone, right? Yes, being fatigued. Ooh, <laughs> well, I, I won't touch that one. That last one right there, that's a whole, that's an actual trigger event. We just might actually see some common responses if I if I brought that out verbally. So those that you guys noticed in the chat, I'll just leave that there. Um, yes, we're human. These are common responses. And this is part of the, the common languaging that we want to create, right? And it's a shift in paradigm. And so we start to see those, those kinds of behaviors um, and, and actions, those common reactions, both in the high and low zone. Next slide. Right. Um, 
go ahead and click through. There we go. And we start to see some this 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 cycle, especially during COVID, right? So loss of jobs, right? Closures, there's this grief, financial housing, food insecurity, and then there's this per, per, um, per, uh, perpetuating of, of, of consequences of those safety measures, right? An economy down, down swirling, uh, um, small businesses, and then, and then, and then on top of that, the, and, and again, I won't go there too, too uh, but then maybe the opportunity for better leadership more to step into this and, and a little more humane response and it's not happening, right? And then in the, on an election year, oh, mercy, how, you know, it, there's just so much going on. And I think that this is important when we think of the spectrum and, and whatever side of the aisle, wherever you're at on the, um, in, in your perspectives on the safety protocols versus control, all of that, and yes, we're human. These are all, we're all having different responses. We all bring our own perspectives into this. The commonality is we're human. Can we see that piece no matter where they're at on the spectrum? And how do we increase the, the zone of well being so we can have better conversations and learning opportunities? Yeah. All right. <laughs> There's a correction. Well, see, there, I made the assumption because there is for some who've been looking at some of those things as well, right? And that, that brings up a good point, right? Is that um, a lot of this work has really little to do with the reality of what someone says or does. It's more about my perception of what was said and done. And that's my reality. And that's what my nervous system responds to. It either bumps me up or bumps me down, right? And if we can understand that, I think we have a better opportunity to engage more effectively. And it, and, it, and it falls on those of us who have, with great knowledge, right, um, the opportunity then to, to support others, right? With that knowledge comes responsibility. When we understand how the nervous system works, then, then we, we, can, we can do that more, more effectively. All right, um, next slide, please. So again, common reactions. You can go ahead and click through this. I wanna to get to our skills. Go ahead one more time, please, Heather. All right, so we're going to look at a couple of key concepts, and I think this is this is important. Um, here's the key concept, right? Going back to biology versus mental weakness. This is a new way of seeing behavior, right? It's not it's not deviant, right? This is an individual responding to the neurobiology of stress, and they're doing the best they can in response to that, right? This isn't about um, character. Necessarily, this isn't about um, weakness and depravity. At a foundation, this is a nervous system responding to an external stressor complicated by internal beliefs and experiences. Right? <laughs> My own life experiences and beliefs complicate the external stressors that I experience, <laughs> right? Because it doesn't matter what externally happened as much as what I internally make of it. The meaning I attribute to it. That is what tends to activate my nervous system, sends me up or sends me down, right? And so it's a new way of looking at the experiences that we have. Next slide, please. So natural rhythms in nature also exist within the human nervous system. That's the thing that we want to understand, right? That as we flow through that resilience zone, there may be times that I'm bumped up high and, and Acknowledging it and recognizing it creates the opportunity to work with it, right? And just recognizing the flow, recognizing the patterns. We don't have to be trapped by the storms of our body and our sensations. Here's, the, here's another key takeaway. Our nervous system communicates to us through sensations in our body in which when we were really young, we spoke that somatic language very well. And as we aged, we learned to ignore the, the, the sensory inputs from our body, we became more cognitive. We begin, we, we focus more on our thoughts and our emotional existence. And we learned to tune out a lot of the um, intuitive information that was coming in through the senses. And so this is, this, this uh, approach is really about reacclimating to another level of information coming into the human body and translated and understood by our brain in order to make healthier, more effective decisions, right? 
And so it requires that we, we get re in touch and create and uh, expand our somatic languaging, right? And so next slide. And this is important because it's in this process that we start to build this thing called neuroplasticity, the ability for the brain to continue to, to grow and create new synaptic pathways through every new experience is another opportunity to build a new connection. And with those new connections come opportunity for new outcomes, right? It's that old adage, you know, we used to say you can't teach an old dog tricks, new tricks. No, but you can give them experiences that help to rewire their brain that they might learn new tricks, right? It's the experiences that begin to wire our brain. Old experiences wired my current brain and, 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 and how I see the world today. New experiences allows my brain to continue to be developed and reshaped, right? And, and, and I like to say that our brain is more like Plato than cement, right? Um, so next slide. And we're gonna address why a biological intervention. So toxic stress, right? Too much, too fast, too little, too long too much for too long, right? So this is really that, so there, there's a little bit of stress is healthy, right? It, 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 remember we talked about that uh, uh, in order to build resilience, we need a little bit of adversity. It's the overwhelming adversity, which leads to toxic stress. And that happens when there's too much too fast. COVID was too much too fast. <laughs> I mean, that just happened quick, right? Too little for too long, right? Slow simmer. Right? It's just like the steady drip of adversity over a long period of time. And then too much for too long. And I think that's where we're at today, right? This has been, man, it's been too much. It wasn't just COVID, right? It's a lot of the, the systemic things that COVID revealed, right? The disparities in, 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 our, in our systems systemically, right? And, and then our responses to that. It's been too much for too long. And many of us are, are just overwhelmed. And so this is an opportunity for us to build the skills that we can return to our resilient zone and, and, and stay in that zone of well-being so that we don't have the, the negative outcomes associated with toxic stress, right? The health outcomes that are related to that to stress and disease, right? And so that's why this is so important. Next slide. So there's, there's three skills that we're briefly gonna to touch on. Again, I, want, I just wanna stress, um, this is a six hour training and that's a tight schedule already. <laughs> so I'm just giving you a, a, a 10,000 foot view of the first three skills. We're gonna be looking at tracking, resourcing and grounding or the three, uh, the basic three in the CRIM model, right? Um, that, that, that create a solid foundation for building individual and collective resilience. Next slide. So um, I wanna start with help now, a help now resource, okay? Um, before we go into those three, the, the other three skills. So the next slide, and then Heather, uh, someone who is helping <laughs> is gonna drop in the uh, chat a link to the, uh, Trauma Resource Institute, um, who've created this curriculum and have been developing this model. There's also a therapeutic model. It's, it's called TRI, uh, Trauma Resiliency um, Initiative. And so that's a, a clinical base um, application and, and specifically for licensed clinician practitioners, mental health practitioners. The CRIM model, Community Resiliency Model, is um, is is for everyone else, right? And so this iChill app that you can go that go through, which really I want to draw your attention to is um, this is an old slide, but when this this um, landing page comes up on the app, you'll see a button that says Help Now, and you can press Help Now, and it'll walk through ten Help Now strategies that anyone can use when they get bumped up or down out of their resilient zone. An example of that would be to drink a cold glass of water, right? Um, and there's some science behind the cold glass of water. And you can enhance the, the utility of that by noticing the sensation of the cold water as it goes down, um, as you drink it, right? Notice that. 
and it's actually bringing your focused awareness back in and it's a grounding has a grounding effect right so these are some really great tools um and and you know what's interesting is you could use these with um uh, with kids teenagers it's a really useful piece so i just wanted to kind of share that um these are those things like in that moment something happened too quick too fast right and you're bumped up high right and these are 10 strategies that you can use right now to help yourself get back into the zone of resilience. Next slide. So 1040, okay. Um, so we're doing pretty good on time. And so I wanna talk a little bit about this first skill because this is the foundational skill in the CRIM model. And it's, it's, it's tracking our awareness of sensations body sensations, right? Next slide. Tracking is the foundation for helping stabilize our nervous system. Tracking is noticing or paying attention to sensations, to what is happening inside the body in a present moment. But here's, here's a, a little caveat. Here's the thing, right? We, we, we often use language that, that doesn't, doesn't align with what we're really wanting to notice. Someone will say, I feel, right? What we want you to do is notice the sensation because it's a different, we most often associate feel with a feeling or an emotional response. And so what happens is we don't get the clarity of the somatic expression and the languaging of the body that comes through when we bring our mind and, and awareness to focusing on the sensations themselves. Where are we sensing? Where are we experiencing that sensation, right? And so some of the somatic languaging would, would, would be uh, language that describes the sensation, sharp, tight, um, hot, cold, right? Um, like when, when, so when I get, uh, I, when I first started practicing these skills, I noticed right in the center of uh, just below my breastplate, right? right there, that there was this um, kind of queasy roller coaster like feeling. But uh, what I used to call when I was a kid, the whoop de doo You ever been driving down somewhere and you go over this whoop de doo like that and you're like, woohoo, right? But it's really, it's really subtle. And as I started practicing mindfulness and noticing, I noticed it was there a lot. The more I began to practice noticing what we focus on grows, my awareness grew. And I started thinking, man, that's there a lot. All of a sudden, and I realized, no, it was there all along. I just learned to ignore it. I wasn't, it was outside my field of awareness, right? So on this next slide, doorways of expanding well-being, right? This is what we've typically, we've moved a lot towards this cognitive model of thinking, right? And what we want to do is we want to expand a more holistic way of understanding our experiences as humans to include not just the thinking, not just the emotional feeling, but also the sensing. And this is a lot to do with the, uh, uh, Peter Levine's work and, and just the, the what happens somatically in the body as a result of trauma, right? And adversity. And so being able to bring this back into uh, our field of awareness really helps to enhance our ability to respond more effectively and actually, actually begin to pick up the activation of the nervous system much quicker before our thinking has turned to, I gotta sock this dude, <laughs> right? That, that's because I'm frustrated, something happens, right? And I'm thinking, man, I wanna hit him. But guess what? There was probably some sensory input well before that that was happening because of my safety system, right? My social engagement system, Stephen um, Purge's uh, 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 work on polybagel theory, right? That I'm, I'm, I'm sensing and picking up threats well before my cognition has translated and understood what those were and be able to contextualize them, right? This, that, that there's a lot of of thinking that doesn't happen, but my somatic system, my sensing, oh, my spidey senses kind of go off right away. I'm looking at facial affect, um, body posturing. This dude's threatening. He's smiling at me, right? But he's trying to punk me. And I'm, I'm kind of feeling that, right? I'm sensing that rather. 
well before any of those other normal ways of experiencing that situation, right? And if I can do that, that's a, that's a, uh, I can intervene sooner as I'm going up outside of my res uh, resilient zone, right? I'm already started in that flow. And then something's happening, I'm going up here. I can sense that I can then employ a skill that allows me to come back into that flow and smile and keep on keeping on there. Yeah? Next slide. What we pay attention to grows. That's what I kind of just talked about right now. If we start paying attention to our sensations, our ability to respond well when they're communicating, when our body's communicating to us, that increases. Next slide. Scientific research about building resilience, brain cells that fire together, wire together, right? So this idea is that as we begin to pay attention, what we focus on, right? That metacognition what we focus on, this is an important piece to the skill because as I'm recognizing the activation of my upswing on, on my nervous system, if I can use the skill and bring it back down to where I stay within the cognitive functioning piece and I can recontextualize and start using my, my higher cortical functioning and start really reshaping the understanding and all that, right? Those neurons are firing together and I can begin to maybe think about, well, maybe this person's just had a bad day, right? Because I'm not outside of my zone. I'm in my resilience zone. And I can start to think more compassionately and respond in a more uh, supportive manner, dealing, working with kids, right? Um, that they, they come in from recess or come in from another class or whatever, they might be fully activated. And, and, and I, if I have greater capacity, I can re, rethink about that way that that kid just told me to go do something, right? <laughs> and, 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 and not and, and respond, take care of my own need, recognize my sensations, recognize my nervous system, and then say, huh, I wonder what happened to Billy. I wonder what, what, what got here, because he's normally not like that, right? Rather than just go to the office, right? Or whatever that response might be, right? And so this is really an important piece to building that. And the more that we're able to do that, the more connections we create, the, 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 the more capacity for being resilient happens, right? Next slide. And again, we go into a lot of this in the, the six hour study, but we really start to look at the neuroscience around it. We don't have time to deal, dig into this, but I just really want to stress that these skills are deeply based and rooted in the neuroscience and research evidence-based. Next slide. And, and this slide just kind of represents this, uh, another, some, some other research that have been looking at um, just an awareness of, of where we begin to people sense and, and the, the images are illustrative. There's not a machine that they, you know, that they're detecting feelings in the body this way. This, this was used to communicate um, uh, uh, individuals' responses that related to these emotions where they were sensing when they, when they experienced envy. What were some of the language that they were expressing in terms of where at and mapping it out on the body where they were noticing these things, right? Next slide. When we learn to discern the difference between sensation and distress and well-being, we can begin to have choice. And that's the thing, right? Our body, our body doesn't always have the ability to distinguish um, a lot of those sensations. That's why our higher cortical thinking brain comes into play, right? But I have to recognize the input data from the sensory, from the from the body, stay regulated and act and be able to access the higher executive function to think about it in, 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 in broader terms and begin to make the distinction between sensations of anger and, and, and threat and sensations of sadness and, and, and missing, right? Or, or embarrassment, because each one of those may allow a different response. If I have clarity, Right? But if they just get jumbled into a single sensation and right, I'm up here already, um, I might say something that's later on, I'm like, ah, okay, now I got to go say I'm sorry. And then like that email, we start avoiding that, right? <laughs> All right, next slide. Track is, tracking is noticing and paying attention to what's happening inside your body at the present moment. And here's the key, without judgment. I'm just going to pause there and let that really sit in without the negative connotations, 
societal beliefs, all those deeper issues, that's where the challenge is, right? Because we might notice it. That's actually what caused us to ignore them to begin with. Have you ever heard the saying by an adult to a kid, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. We just connected that, that sensation of whatever's going on with the expected response of shame, right? So next time that happens, I, I'm gonna experience the shame. I don't wanna do, so we have to, we have to think about that, right? Um, yeah, so I'll leave that one there without judgment. Curiosity, but without judgment. Next slide. So that's the foundational skill of tracking. It's just noticing what's going on in the inside in the present moment. When we talk about resourcing, anybody got any ideas? We're gonna drop this in the chat. What do you think we're talking about when we're talking about resourcing? What are some, what, what are your thoughts about resources when I talk about the skill of resourcing? This is just because I've been talking and you've been sitting and I want you to engage, but I'm also interested to think, hear about what your thoughts are. Resourcing as a skill, that's the key. Resourcing as a skill. No takers? Maybe we're typing. There we go. Accessing supports around us, going to my strengths or my people. Yes, going to my peoples. Yes. With help. Yep. Anyone else? Resourcing. Going out to actively look for what will support and nourish me. I love that. It's great. <laughs> Having the access. Yeah. So, next slide. What do you see in this slide? Tell me what you think is going on here. What might be um, the sensations that this group each think of the look at an individual in this slide and maybe think of what might be going on inside what kind of pleasant thoughts might be happening joy see that yes comfort having fun hunger I'm glad to be out of the house <laughs> without a mask. <laughs> oh, I should have gotten there, I'm just kidding. Connected, being silly, belonging, wow, yep. Good, good. So, so resourcing, right, is what we did at the very beginning. Remember those three questions? What uplifts you? That's a, that's a resource. Who or what brings you or gives you strength? It's a resource, right? Who or what uh, um, helps you in a time of need? Those are all resources that we identify and, and we can activate, right? We can access. <laughs> Resourcing a resource is any person, place, thing, memory, or part of yourself that makes you feel calm, pleasant, peaceful, strong, or resilient, right? A resource can be real or imagined. So I can't see my, my, my video feed. Oh, there it is, okay. But that's my resource. Gardening. This sits right outside my, my office here at home. And when I'm working on a, a 12 page term paper, I look out my sliding door and I'm like, oh, I'm so glad they wanna go out there. I love just to dig in the dirt. And I gotta tell you, um, I fight with the squirrels and squirrels get most of the, of the produce out of my garden. The rest of the family, not big on the things that I grow, except for the strawberries that you see there. But like, you know, the vegetables, the onions, the zucchini and all those things. Oh, I love those things, right? Um, but you know what I love more, more, most about it, what brings me straight is just digging in the dirt. And when I'm overwhelmed with writing that paper, I just want to go dig in the dirt, right? It's a resource for me. When I look out there and I think when I was building the, 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 the raised flower bed, 
I had a lot of joy. My back hurt, <laughs> right? But it brought me a great sense of joy. When I look at that picture, right? It's a source of pleasant experiences for me, right? Just by looking at it. And, 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 and any moment where I might feel I'm going out of my resilient zone, I can bring up those thoughts and that memory and that image of it and how much I enjoy it. And guess what? I can draw my attention and focus. And I can start tracking the sensations that I'm having now because of that resource that I brought to my awareness and notice the sensation and, and, and the shift from that unpleasant experience of stress and being overwhelmed to an, a, a, a sense of moving towards neutral or even pleasant. And it's in that recognition of moving between the unpleasant sensations to a more pleasant experience or sensing is where I, it's the work of building resilience. This is where the reps come in, right? Building that resilient muscle. As we recognize, can we move to neutral? This is very unpleasant. Can I use one of my resources to move to neutral where it's not, it's not really happy, but you know what? I'm more neutral. And then can I add another resource or another skill that then allows me to move to something more pleasant? Can I bring my awareness to a part of my body that feels less um, unpleasant? And then can I notice the sensation? Can I notice the shift? That's building the resilient zone, right? So this is the second fundamental skill in this model. Next slide. So in your handout, there's some resourcing exercises that we don't have time to engage in here, but I encourage you to look through those. Um, but one of the pieces is about resource, resource intensification. Thinking about one of those answers that you had talked about, right? We can intensify the, the sensations and that experiencing the pleasant experience by starting to, to notice some details and calling out some details about that, right? So for my for me, my garden, the the what you're seeing right there is the 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 raised flower bed, the strawberries, right? And then I have some flowers, some, 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 um, some, oh my goodness, I can't think of what they are. Um, pansies. My father-in-law's favorite uh flower is pansies. So every year I plant pansies in the garden for my wife because her dad's gone on. And it's one of those things, and, and it brings pleasure to see that, right? Those are, those are things. And so they're intentionally in the garden to acknowledge my father-in-law. Um, I have a table out there that I sit and I do some, some um, quiet time meditation and reading. As I think about all the details, that's intensification of that resource. It's building out those details. And so those sensations and those pleasant experiences become more robust. Right? So as we start to identify something that we enjoy, something that's pleasant, we can intensify that experience by starting to draw our awareness to some of the details. And, and guess what? As you sound like, oh, that was pretty fun. Oh, did you notice that before? No. Guess what? That's a resource. Right? Or you're like, oh, I absolutely didn't like that. Guess what? That's not a resource for you. So, <laughs> right? <laughs> you may not want to uh, think about that when you're you're, you're going out of your zone. You may want to think, bring your awareness to something else, right? But that's the idea of resourcing, right? And then notice the sensations connected to the resource. That's where the power comes, right? The resource itself is something that allows your nervous system to shift, but it's the tracking skill coupled with the resourcing and the differential between the, the sensations from unpleasant to pleasant is the building piece. That's the strengthening and the resilient builder, okay? All right, next slide. In your handout, there's some things about what you can do with kids. Keep going, right? You can ask children this. They'll tell you what their resources are, right? Um, Paw Patrol is my five-year-old. Unicorns is my five-year-old. And I'll ask her, what kind of unicorn? And she'll start, get, she'll start intensifying the unicorn. Rainbow, the, the, the horn is a rainbow color with sparkly hooves, right? She'll build out all those details. I'm like, wow, what else? And, and, and she'll go on and she goes, you know, dad, unicorns are real. I don't like it when you tell me that I'm using my imagination, right? Because they're real. I'm like, oh, my, my bad, my bad, right? But she had built out the, and, and her, her face lights up when she talks about unicorns. 
And guess what? When she's kind of feeling a little bit discouraged, missing family, not being able to see her friends at school, I'll ask her, is there something else that you can think about that might help you? <sighs> yeah, because she knows, right? She'll say, I can think about the unicorns. And I'm like, well, tell me about the unicorn. And then she'll start, and then she will shift. It's amazing. I'm saying like, how do you feel now? She goes, well, I still miss my friends, but I love unicorns. <laughs> and then she just goes on and she's good to go. She, whoo, right? It's building those, that social emotional literacy and skills and, and capacity for our, for our people, our young people to in, embrace and hit these, these, these challenges and still do well. I love these skills. Take them with you anywhere. All right, grounding. <clears throat> I think right about now we're, 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 we're looking at um, 15 minutes about what we have left. So um, I, I think we're doing good on time. So I, I wanna kind of open it up in the chat. What questions do you have? What, what are some thoughts? I mean, again, I just like squirted you all down with the fire hose with some of this stuff, right? So um, let's take a moment and just what, what's resonating with you right now, right? I like to sometimes say, uh, I want you to think your head, heart, hands. What's something that stimulated your head, your thought, your thinking? What's something that touched your heart, right? That tapped into a sense of passion? Um, what, what's activating your hands? What's something that you want to like, oh, I gotta get, I wanna do something, I wanna do it, right, right? So head, heart, hands response. Censoring language on the handout is very helpful, good. Anyone else? Questions, thoughts? We could even maybe unmic if you want to kind of engage in, a, in some questions or thoughts. If we were in person, we would have had a lot of table conversations going on. Connecting, tracking to resources, tracking peace, noticing what is happening in my body. Yes, refamiliarizing ourselves with our natural language. It's the first language we spoke before we learned how to use words. As a baby, I felt wetness and I cried because I didn't know what else to do, but I knew it wasn't comfortable. Max, maximizing resource, good. First time I heard the resource can be real or imagined. That's good. I like that, not crazy, just adapting, yes. <laughs> My daughter would agree, holy, you know, I'm not crazy. Unicorns are real, they work for me. <laughs> The piece about resources being imagined is great for those who have limited resources, yes. And I would add to this is that a lot of times those resources are outside of our field of awareness, right? Um, one of the skills is gesturing, um, self-soothing behavior, right? They just don't recognize it, right? They might be doing this thing right here, shaking, tapping, but when we can bring them, that's a whole nother piece, but if we can bring their awareness, oh, I notice that you, and they're like, oh yeah. Or maybe it's like pulling on a, a, a necklace. They'll do something like this as they're thinking. Um, so yes, absolutely. Accepting where you are emotionally and be present with the feeling, yes. And, and not, be, not be swept away, right? It's that equanimity piece. It's, it's allowing the river of emotional experiences to flow knowing that this too will pass. Good, thank you, Heather. She dropped in the 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 link to the to the PDF. Is there currently a notion, uh, uh, a national coordinator uh, resiliency campaign to help with, oh, that's great. Who is that? Saul. That, you know what, I, I think, I, I don't know if it's organized on a national coordinated effort, that's a huge piece, but it's like through ACES Connection, they are networking like-minded uh, local and regional networks of people working around these concepts and, and, and they are working towards a, a national movement in reaching a tipping point. So if you're not familiar with ACES Connection, I encourage you to look there um, because there are many, many, many people around the nation, around the world that are starting to coordinate around this and share information. Absolutely, I, I just um, see that, that the recovery effort is really, really accelerating while fatigue levels are at an all time high and uh, a bit of a tricky thing for the next three to four months. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And and that's what's great about this is because we can share these skills with others, right? We practice them first and then and then we build our capacity 
And what's really great is when we start to think about the resilient focused approach, not just the trauma informed, right, but the resilient focused and trauma informed, then it's, it's I'm practicing these skills and then I can be somebody's resource, right? As they're dysregulated, I can be in that space and just my presence might help to co-regulate them, right? And, 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 and then begin to share some of these skills and these ideas that then help them to do that. Then we can engage in problem solving, which is that executive functioning. You, you know, this ought to be like a mandated course for all politicians and I'll leave that one there. All right. <laughs> Everyone is now able, oh yes, yes. So they activated that. So feel free to unmute if you'd like to share. All right. Okay, good. I just needed to drink some coffee and then also wanted to catch my breath. Good. <laughs> All right, moving on. So grounding. Talk to me about grounding. Because I I, uh, I I think this is, looking at the roster, everybody who registered for this, I'm assuming, I'm making some assumptions, but uh, uh, quite a few, I'm sure, kind of have some idea around this. Um, Zoo is telling me that you have an older version of Zoom. Okay. That's outside my scope of... of expertise and so i'll know what that what's that's going on um okay so uh grounding somebody want to give me uh 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 your idea of what grounding is i just fell off the planet right F fell down from from mars i don't know nothing about nothing um explain to me grounding you can drop it in the chat or you can call it out Hey, Brian, this is Randy. Um, hey, Randy. Uh, one thing we do, uh, um, we work at Alton, Al alternate high school, alternative high school, and, and a lot of the kids come from trauma. And one thing that we do with, we call grounding is, is when a kid is starting to trigger is we help remind them where they are, that they're in a safe place, that they're, and yep. try to connect with them and just kind of make them bring them back to a general awareness of, of where they are and that they're safe at this time. Absolutely, I like that, that's good. And then um, I think that was Denise, ooh, these glasses need more power. Um, Recentering into reality, I like that. Being aware of where you are and um, where, you're, where you're through your senses. Yes, 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 I love that piece, right? So it's not a cognitive recognition, right? But using the body and the senses to override the cognitive distortion that has allowed all of my previous experiences and all this stuff to just come flooding over me and allows me to ground in the present moment and recognize and make a distinction between the memory capsules that are bursting in my head related to the sensation and what's actually going on in the moment, right? So good, good. Okay, next slide. So grounding skills, um, using uh, the direct contact of the body or, or, or part of the body with something that provides support in the present moment. And it's because we're activating the senses, right? So it's something that you can do. You might be talking with somebody and feeling just a little bit dysregulated. And all of a sudden you can just start squeezing your toes in your shoes, feeling the support from the ground. Cause you know, like, man, if this guy keeps talking, I'm going to say something stupid. <laughs> right because uh, I just don't really feel I don't like the way that uh, maybe he's coming off and and so I just need a ground so I can just bring my awareness to my toes and notice the support of the ground and maybe really thinking about some glue that's keeping my feet to the ground so I don't kick this dude in the backside right no I'm just kidding but you understand so it's it's any part of the body that comes into contact with um some other physical structure that allows me to sense the kind of support that comes from that, right? It, um, if our relationship to the earth is not safe, then all other relationships don't uh, develop optimally, right? When we are grounded, we have a sense of self in the relationship to present time and space, and we're not worried about the past or the future, right? So that grounding helps to bring us to the present moment, right? And those, that's where the help now skills come in. Those apps are really that app really identifies 10 immediate kind of uh, grounding kind of activities that you can do, right, in that moment. So what's interesting, you can ground into many positions, lying down on the surface, even floating on water. If you notice the, the support, right, from the water, the buoyancy, and if you're bringing your awareness and you're like, oh, this is cool. And even the rhythmic 
floating up and down, right? It's the bringing the key, tracking, noticing the sensation, in, and intensifying the sense of uh, or recognizing the pleasure or support or the comfort that comes from that contact, right? So it's using all three of those, those skills together to manage and, and, and stay in the wellness zone. Standing against the wall, pushing, right? Again, so these are those 10 skills that are in the app, right? You can even use sound, right? Because that, that's causing me to put my focus and tension, right? Listening to maybe something that's moving away. I live um, about a mile and a half from the 99 corridor on, on um, near Clinton. And early in the morning, I can tell the difference between a small car or truck, right? And I just sit out there and I practice and I listen I, where I can first pick it up. And I, and I hear it get louder and I watch it, listen, or listen to it as it fades away. I'm developing that. It's a focus skill, right? And then I can use that when I'm dysregulated as well as I'm walking around. I can go for a walk. So great skills here. All right. So we've talked about defining the, the uh, excuse me, pandemic fatigue, resilience. We looked at a, a resilience focused approach, went over the, uh, the CRIM model, went briefly through six, um, uh, three of the six skills, right? So that was that next slide, um, Heather. Right, and then, so I want to leave with designing a, a self-care strategy. And I think we got four minutes to do this. Um, and it's good because it's, it's one last of two slides. So a, a self-care strategy, right? The first step is identifying unpleasant sensations through tracking, right? Recognizing that this sensation connected to this experience, this event or whatever's happening and notice that it's, this, it's unpleasant. And then using a resource, grounding or help now skill to shift your awareness to something that's either neutral or pleasant. And then notice the difference, right? And then move towards more pleasant or neutral sensations. So, so you're developing a skill. It's like, oh, this is not, this don't feel good, right? Remember I told you about that, that feeling I had, that, that whoop doo feeling? And then all of a sudden, as I was able to um, notice it more and bring my attention, it was there like all the time because it was outside my field of awareness. And the more I started noticing it, it's like, man, this is uncomfortable. I don't like this. Why? What is this? And then I started like, okay, what just happened? Why am I feeling this? Right? This is my nervous system. It's my body telling me something. I'm like, okay, what in the environment <laughs> is my body perceiving in such a way that it, it's sending me this information? Right. And, and if I can't figure it out, that's OK, too. But then I'm like, OK, I'll use a resource, use a skill. Right. Notice the difference between the unpleasant and I'm moving more towards a neutral or hopefully a more pleasant sensation. And then I notice that. And one of the other skills is shift and stay. It's noticing the shift and then stay there. Right. And, and in noticing the distinction between the unpleasant and the pleasant and being able to anchor in that and then just really intensify that resources and, and that sensation of pleasant so that the ruminating thoughts don't take me back to the thing that disrupted me, right? <laughs> so I can stay here. So shift and stay is another, another skill. So, um, and then as you start to think about this, right? How do you integrate this um, as a self-care strategy that's not, a lot of times we talk about self-care as like something I add on top of my stress. Right, I'm gonna go eat something that's fun, right? I'm gonna go do this, but it doesn't do anything to, to, to reduce the level of current stress experiencing. I'm trying to increase my joy without decreasing the stressors, right? Without addressing my nervous system's activation fully, especially in this COVID area, right? This allows me to bring the nervous system back into the zone of wellness, not just add something to this, right? And leave this right here, right? leave the, the level of my stress by just going to add because at some point you just can't keep adding. We have to process. We have to allow our body a healthy processing of that stress, acknowledge it, shift and move. We don't ignore it. We move and we, 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 we see it. We acknowledge the stress. We acknowledge the, the unpleasant feeling. We embrace it because we have skills. Now to minimize and mitigate the harmful effects, we're able to shift it, we're able to think, we're able to use these biologically based skills to reduce that, bring us back to a condition of safety 
and be able to think and ask the question as one of the other pieces, what else is true, right? That's that, that, there's that cognitive piece that allows me to shift, right? Once I'm able to move the sensation, then I start using some cognitive skills and other resources, right? Okay, yeah, this is happening, what else is true? Well, in spite of COVID-19, we're still doing okay, right? In spite of all this stuff, it, it was a blessing in disguise. We, we, we have people talking, maybe yelling, but you know, at some point the dialogue around the structural uh, uh, inequities, I'm hoping because we've had this universal trauma that has affected everybody, I think we're having some different kinds of conversations. And the more of these skills we can get out, maybe the more functional conversations we can have that leads to better outcomes, right? Last slide. If you're interested in um, a four hour presentation of this, um, after you've done this introduction, we could do a four hour presentation of this. Um, feel free to uh, email me. We can talk about bringing this training to you, to a group of folks that you have, or if we have enough people interested, we can do a, a, a community-based one or for your organization. I'm also a, a certified um, uh, <laughs> relational, uh, TBRI, trust-based relational intervention. We also do a, a resilient focused trauma informed certification training. So if you're interested or in any of these trainings, feel free to give me, um, uh, reach out to me or to Heather. Um, I want to thank you. I got a minute over, I'm good. Any questions as we transition? It's all yours, Heather. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, that was amazing. We're all so grateful that you could come and we really enjoyed your presentation so much. So thank you. Um, and just to let everyone know, if you do have, oops, I'm not very good at this. Um, if you do have more questions um, and, you don't, and we don't get to them today, you can send your questions to me and I will um, include them in the email that goes out with the handouts and the other follow-up materials. Um, we do want to let you know that we will be having our convening. Um, I know it's usually in October and we're, um, we're missing you all, like we said, but we will be having the convening in March, uh, March 11th. So save that date if you can. It will be a virtual convening and it'll have some amazing presentations. The focus this time is suicide prevention. So we have um, some amazing keynotes and a youth panel and some breakout sessions planned. Um, and it's all coming together really nicely. So we're really hoping that you can um, attend and save that date and more information will come on the details of that. Um, so hoping you can all make it. And then you can always access to the schoolhealthcenters.org um, website for conference materials from the state conference, statewide conference that CSHA had this last um, fall and also our past convenings and other uh, resources on schoolhealthcenters.org. Um, and then we're always looking for information about what you need, what you need training on, what you need support with, what you need resources for in your, you know, day-to-day -day work. Um, so please send any ideas or needs that you have for um, training or otherwise to me. And that's my email there at the bottom of the screen, heberg at csufresno.edu. And I'm always happy to get your feedback and questions and all of that. So please reach out if you'd like to. Amy, do you have, or I'm sorry, yeah, Amy, do you have anything else to add uh, maybe for this slide or other upcoming events you wanna announce? No, just that we're um, really excited to be with everyone today and excited to hopefully see everyone again in March. Um, and definitely do reach out for, um, with any ideas of other presentations, other topics you'd like to see for these meetings. Yeah, thanks. And um, we have a few minutes for you all to make announcements um, about things that you're working on or doing. So if you, you should be able to speak now, if you want to go ahead and put it in the chat or um, go ahead and talk about things that you have um, coming up that you'd like to announce to your community. Brian's still here too. So if you have questions for Brian, um, you might be able to fit those in as well.
I'm thinking you all have things you're doing. Hopefully you can speak if you need to. Well, maybe people want 10 minutes to go practice some grounding and think a little bit more about what we learned from Brian and how we might um, apply it to our, our lives and our work and the people that we work with. Oh, I do see one note about volunteer opportunities. Yeah, Children's Institute. <laughs> yeah, that's in chat. So um, you can contact Nicole Smith, Dr. Nicole Smith at uh, the email there. She's at Fresno State. Uh, she's... Um, the interim director, I think still interim, um, for the Central California Children's Institute at Fresno State. So she's looking for volunteers. Anyone else have volunteer opportunities? You can definitely post them in the chat or let us know. And otherwise, I think we're ready to sign off, yeah? And an evaluation will be sent to you automatically when you log off and we will send out the handouts from Brian as well as any other resources. Thank you again to Brian and thank you to Heather and thank you to all of you. Appreciate you all. This is one of the get to do's I get. Um, a lot of have to do's, this is a get to do. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. We really enjoyed your presentation. Grateful to you, thank you. you guys be safe, have a good day. You too. Bye everybody, take good care of yourselves. Hope to see you in person soon. <laughs>